Thank you. And welcome everyone. I see some people coming in on Periscope and everyone on LM Virtual. This is our second episode with I Married a Mystic. And uh, this morning I feel really inspired to explore the theme of transfer of training. And uh, so I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning of the course and just give a context for what transfer of training is. And, uh, and then perhaps share, um, read a little from the book, some parables, where it's an example of what it actually means and looks like to, to practice with this. So, so right at the beginning in the course, uh, right before the lessons, in the introduction, Jesus writes about the purpose of the workbook. And the purpose of the workbook is to train your mind in a systematic way to a different perception of everyone and everything in the world. And I love how Jesus is so absolute when when he talks about something like this, it's everything and everyone. So this is, this is the essential nature of the healing of the mind. It's total. We have to go for a total transformation of consciousness and of making no exceptions. So he says, it's the purpose of the workbook is to train your mind in a systematic way to a different perception of everyone and everything in the world. And the exercises are planned to help you generalize the lessons so that you will understand that each of them is equally applicable to everyone and everything you see. Transfer of training in true perception does not proceed as does the transfer of the training of the world. So when you think of transfer of training in the world, you might think that you could learn some skills in a certain area and then you can build on those skills and, and get better at doing something. You end up becoming specialized you know, with your particular skills. But this is very different. This is, this is a course in unlearning, actually, and undoing um, our identification with the world and learning to have a different perception of everyone and everything. So it's not a skill set that we're building on that we get better and better and better at accumulating something or um, reaching a point where there is this sense of an I know, oh, I know, you know, um, where I'm at in my spiritual journey, or I know what it's all going to look like and form, or I know my own best interests because of my past learning. That's the training of the world, and the training that we're going for is very different. He says, if true perception has been achieved in connection with any person, situation, or event, then total transfer to everyone and everything is certain. On the other hand, one exception held apart from true perception makes its accomplishments anywhere impossible. So this is what we're going to zoom into today. If we make one exception, if we allow one grievance and say, well, that's justified, then that's enough to maintain the world as you know it and maintain your identification in it as it has been in the past. So we want to really explore this and come into this point where we we're not making any exceptions. We're willing to bring everything up to the light, to be questioned and released from our mind. 
So this is just how he starts off the workbook. And, and the purpose of the lessons of the workbook, of course, are to have um, a real experience um, of then understanding all that's in the text. So I could just um, flip to a lesson and just have a little example of this. Or we could go straight for lesson one, actually. Nothing I see means anything. So if you were practicing with that lesson and you looked around the room and it would be pretty easy to kind of look at the table and say, this table does not mean anything. And then you could look at the the table leg and say well this table leg does not mean anything it's kind of transferring transferring the idea transferring the training but then if you look and you see a, a photograph of your family or even an image of Jesus you might want to skip over that <laughs> and go to something that's a little more inanimate like the fireplace oh the fireplace does not mean anything Jesus is saying oh no 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 exceptions remember <laughs> If we have one exception to this transfer of the training, then there is something that I believe about this world that is real and valuable and that I would not want to release and give back over to the Holy Spirit. So that's one little example of the transfer of training to make no exceptions. And he's good in here. He says, you, you know, use it totally indiscriminately. Don't, don't pick and choose for yourself. And this is amazing that you can start off with lesson one like this, which basically, it's like the road unfolding before us of, of our pathway of awakening. Like if you can really get that and use that as a practice and completely devote to making no exceptions, your awakening is guaranteed. It's guaranteed because what we're doing is giving back to God the purpose and the meaning that we have given this world, that I've given for myself, my life, my self-concept. And a self-concept isn't just like your own body or your own personality self. Your self-concept includes the whole world that you see. Why? Because we're in relationship with everything. We're in relationship with everything that we see. We're constantly relating um, with everything and giving everything that we see the meaning that it has for us. And the only way to like really free our mind to being back as being the dreamer of the dream is to is to recognize that this is a dream, but you can't recognize it as a dream when some of it is valued. When some of it is valued and wanted, then it's being held on to, even in the subtlest way. So, that's the introduction from Jesus at the beginning of the lessons and um, yeah there's a couple of different ways to approach this but I think the the core question that I found in my journey just absolutely essential um, for aligning my mind with the spirit and becoming aware of the purpose um, of what I was doing things for it was to ask that very question what is it for? what is it for? and when we ask that question with with everything that we're doing it is basically a a question or a statement that is saying um, I don't want to be running on my past conditioning and I don't want to be in automatic pilot I don't want to be unconsciously 
going through my day or doing what I'm doing um, because it's what I've done before or it's what makes me feel uh, safe in some way. So this question, what is it for, is a question that helps us to bring our mind back to the Holy Spirit. And just by asking a question, it means the mind is open to seeing. Like, what am I doing this for? What really is my, my motivation? Because what we do comes from what we think. And what we think comes from what we believe. And there are beliefs in the mind that are unquestioned. And these beliefs that are in the mind are literally running our whole life. It, they're running this whole world until we question them and release them from the mind and give our mind over through this practice and through this very question to learning of a new purpose and being guided from a different place. So that's one way of, of uh, transferring the training of asking for the Holy Spirit's purpose in a very practical way. And of course the other um, practice of inner inquiry and tracing upsets uh, down back into the mind to be released, that is also a very core practice for transferring this training and making no exceptions. So if there is a um, some kind of judgment or reaction or upset, then to just leave it as, as believing that there is someone outside of myself um, has upset me or something outside of myself is the cause of my upset, that really is leaving an exception from the truth. And so no matter what it is, anyone, anything that's seen as being disturbing or being um, anything other than the Holy Spirit's perception of seeing innocence and everything working together for good is an invitation to inquire and explore and want to see what is really going on in mind again so it can be released. And this practice um, is, is worthy of our full attention. Like Jesus says in the Course that you just don't believe that you're worth the effort. You don't believe that you're worth consistent effort. And yet you're the one. Like you are the one who has to give yourself this constant effort and this constant attention for your own mind. We have to honor our own path. We have to honor our own practice and honor our relationship with God. And this practice of being willing to give everything over to the Holy Spirit and continue to invite the Holy Spirit in in order to receive constant awareness of the Holy Spirit. So, I'm going to open up the book. And I'm going to skip straight to chapter 2. So this was in the winter of 2004, 2005, when I had just arrived at the Peace House. So I'd come over from New Zealand, and uh, I was still recovering from a head injury with, with brain damage. And I'd been studying the course for six months, um, and I'd given my life over to Jesus and was following 
um, his, <laughs> just as I said that on Periscope, Jesus OCB just flashed up on the screen, so that's fun. Um, given my life over and was in this pray, listen, follow, pray, listen, follow practice. So chapter two, Heart of Service. And it starts with a quote from the Course. Do you want freedom of the body or of the mind? For both you cannot have. Which do you value? Which is your goal? For one you see as means and the other as the end. So that quote is pretty powerful just in itself. Do you want freedom of the body or of the mind? For both you cannot have. Which do you value? Which is your goal? So if freedom of the body is your goal, then you will be using your body, you will be using your mind to try to achieve that goal. So if you want freedom of the body, then that usually is associated with needing money, like to take trips or to you know, to, to get somewhere else, to have circumstances change. And so your mind will be engaged in trying to be the means for getting you that freedom that you want. Whereas if freedom of mind is your goal, then you will give your body into the service of the Holy Spirit to use as the means for supporting your freedom of your mind. And of course the Holy Spirit's use of the body then is loving and kind. It doesn't involve pushing you, it doesn't involve competition or attack, it, it involves directing you in such a way that your, your body actually functions perfectly without your, your concern because it's in the service to love and so it's actually being taken care of when freedom of our mind is, is our only goal. So here at this phase I was just starting to learn about this and starting to see where I had other goals in, in my mind that I wasn't even aware of. Serving God. Over the coming weeks as I rested, I watched David closely he just didn't seem human. After a few days, I realized that what I was seeing was someone who'd given himself over so fully to being of service to God that he was being used to maximum potential. He was awake at 3 a.m., typing away with his two index fingers in the quiet hours while the world was asleep. Hours later, I would watch him put on one hat after another, playing all of the roles that it usually takes an entire spiritual community to fulfill. He counseled in joy for hours on the phone, answered emails, shared inspirational posts on his Yahoo mailing list, and responded to invitations for gatherings. He also worked on websites, opened the mail, fulfilled requests for CDs, banked checks, cleaned and fueled the car, made dinner, took out the trash, fed the cats, cleaned the litter box, and cleared the snow from the path. <laughs> Soon I found myself being drawn to help. It was impossible not to. David was serving God, and I could feel the purpose behind each action. I could feel that there was no personal motivation behind any of it. As I watched, it all looked so involuntary. The way he suddenly disengaged from emails and moved towards an outing, or stood up from the table and moved back upstairs. I could feel that he was following the Spirit's movement from within. As soon as I began to offer myself to being of service, even in the simple ways, like tending to the cats or making tea, I felt immense joy in my heart from being of service to God. The more I supported David by handling practical tasks, 
the more he was freed up for counseling calls and emails, which inspired me and drew me into a deeper experience of serving God. I felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude. Even though David shone in recognition and sometimes thanked me, the gratitude I was feeling was coming from deep within my own heart. My whole life I had wanted to know where I was meant to be and what I was meant to be doing. The prayer of my heart was finally being answered. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here to um, an experience in the supermarket. And this is a great um, example of transferring the training. So if we just remember lesson one, nothing I see means anything. Um, I can't imagine that many people on the planet can go into the grocery store <laughs> And really keep that lesson in mind. Nothing I see means anything. When you look at, you know, different prices, or you look at different uh, quantities of food that you might get for the same price, or the different quality of food that you might get for the same price, or you look at the health content, you know, what is really healthy, what is organic, what is not organic. You know, can you imagine applying this lesson? going grocery shopping <laughs> and really giving it over to the Holy Spirit to let the Holy Spirit guide you so thoroughly that even if you went in with a list you'd be willing to let the Holy Spirit provide you with what you're meant to walk out of the shop with. It's quite a fun idea isn't it? <laughs> Healthy food thoughts I went with David to the local grocery store and found myself in the peanut butter aisle. Although I'd loosened up somewhat from my phase of taking considerable time preparing organic healthy meals, I still definitely preferred healthy to unhealthy food. We had already been through the fresh produce area and had gone straight past the tiny organic section without stopping. I assumed that David probably didn't believe in either organic food or pesticides as being causative, and I was willing to align with this higher awareness and go beyond purchasing food based on these thoughts. But while David was getting cereal, I went ahead alone to the peanut butter aisle. Before I knew what was happening, I found myself reading the label on the jar aghast to find a long list of ingredients. There were nine ingredients in peanut butter. I grabbed a different brand and it was the same. I began to read the ingredients and although peanuts, salt and oil were recognizable and clearly were meant to be there, there were a number of ingredients that didn't sound like food at all, as well as high fructose corn syrup. I put the peanut butter back on the shelf and moved along to the jelly section. <laughs> I checked out the label again. High fructose corn syrup. My mind went into overdrive. Why is there corn in everything? Is this why so many Americans are overweight? What is with all these cheap filler ingredients? Why don't Americans question such things? New Zealanders wouldn't stand for this. <laughs> I would eventually learn that the fear-based thoughts I had around food, such as fatty foods are bad for the heart and organic food is good for the body, were all, deep down, a fear of death. I would come to realize that these thoughts were not of God and needed to be released. 
At the time, however, I just felt paralyzed, unable to choose. Just then, thank God, David walked down the aisle. David, I said, which brand do you usually get? I'm getting hooked on labels and ingredients and my mind is going crazy. He smiled softly and reached out to select a jar of jelly and a container of peanut butter and we moved on. His very presence was a reminder of the truth and I redirected my trust and the direction of my thinking to the Holy Spirit. I had a long way to go regarding my food beliefs and grocery shopping. Without mind watching, my thoughts were sending me off into conspiracy theories whilst reinforcing a proud patriotic stance. Mm. So that example is obviously one where I could see what was happening in my mind and I could see that trying to make any decisions based on these thoughts and beliefs were having me completely paralyzed. Um, and this same training of watching and praying and listening is, is just still applicable. And there really isn't a cookie cutter approach to awakening. So I'm using the example here of what I was first looking at, having come from a place where I had uh, gone very much into a phase of needing to take care, actually, of myself. Um, after many years of, of pushing myself and really paying very little attention to um, my heart or the spirit, one of my first phases of coming into the spiritual journey was, was actually I was guided to nurture myself with food and to it felt really good buying organic food and I would lovingly light a candle and prepare a meal for myself and, and be very loving and the whole thing felt like a prayer and at this point where I came over here I was moving away from that kind of focus of, of using food and it was more going into this direction of really questioning these beliefs even more so in my mind and there's nothing really there's no hierarchy of illusions so it's not that you know, you should have organic food because it's healthy or at some point you should completely switch and say, no, I won't have organic food because I'm supposed to be spiritual and that would mean it's reinforcing beliefs in my mind. As we're going through this journey, it's a constant prayer. Only the Holy Spirit knows the way to, to guide this complete undoing of our identification with with the ego and with the personality self and it's a development of trust we're being shown with every aspect of of the guidance that comes in in each of these different assignments that we have that the spirit has got it you know that we are taken care of that there is no sacrifice that's our core lesson every step of the way so if you start to get any sense of the ego coming in trying to uh, direct it um, based even on what was what the guidance was last year then again it's it's almost trying to take control of the journey yourself and you can tell by the way that you feel when you're really being guided by this presence of love then there's an openness in your mind there's a softness in your mind it's it's more a state of mind in which you're being shown rather than there's this I know, I must, this is how it has to be. So. Mm. 
think I'm just going to carry straight on and read this next part here. Um, It is the spirit and the bathroom. Since the age of 19, I'd worn my hair very short, dyed black, and styled with gel. There was never a stray eyebrow or facial hair to be seen, and my underarms and legs were always clean shaven. At the Peace House, I was acutely aware of when the next eyebrow hair was about to appear. <laughs> this is, my attentiveness was clearly not on the Holy Spirit yet, it was all on <laughs> the body. <laughs> However, I tried to appear casual and relaxed about my image. After all, I was not meant to care about a self-concept. One day, as I was shaving my legs in the shower, I stopped to ask myself why. It was winter. No one would see them. And David certainly didn't care about such things. I laughed out loud at the thought of shaving my legs for David. And then I realized that I actually wanted to be at my desk replying to a counseling email. And instead I was taking time to shave my legs, which was utterly pointless. I put the razor down and got straight on with where my heart was calling me to be. That was when it dawned on me that asking for guidance was about to go much deeper. There was a lot that I was still doing out of habit, based on assumptions that I had made up along the way in life. In prayer later, I could feel the fear of daring to invite the Spirit into every part of my life. I had never even considered inviting the Spirit into this area. I saw the fear thoughts arise. What if I'm guided to not take care of my body at all? Will it just be neglected? The thoughts led to a feeling of dread. I realized I didn't want to share this with David. If I did, I might have to go through with giving over control, and that was scary. After allowing these thoughts to roll through my mind, my thoughts turned towards David. Although he brushed his teeth often and showered every day, I knew in my heart that he didn't actually care about the body, and I was surprised to find that I was angry at him for this. I wanted him to care about it. I could feel that I was projecting my fear onto him, and the attack thoughts in my mind started to justify my stance of being separate from him. The longer I allowed the thoughts, the worse I felt. So, finally, I shared my realizations with David. I felt a depth coming back into my awareness again, and I felt myself falling back into the deep love that was the purpose of our relationship in God. Over the following month, I watched my mind and practiced listening to the Spirit. I asked before automatically going through the motions of daily body care. And I was relieved to find that I was guided to brush my teeth as usual and to shower every day. The difference was that I was in a loving, listening state of awareness when I did so. My first priority was being with God in prayer. I was often guided to answer emails first and leave the showering and body care until later in the day, rather than doing them in a disconnected, automatic, get it done state of mind. Upon reflection, I recognized that whenever I listened to the ego, I experienced a subtle feeling of sacrifice. But I was learning that the only thing being sacrificed was my peace of mind when I was listening to the ego. Inviting the spirit in was the total opposite 
of sacrifice. So there are just a couple of examples of, of really inviting the spirit in um, and making no exceptions. And I know it's written about in a way that's really light and yet just the fear of, of really inviting the spirit and being willing to give over that control, over to Christ control, is very deep. No, it's very deep. And so it is really important that we let the Holy Spirit guide the unwinding. And what was quite fun after that was I went through a real letting go and a real loosening of image. You know, I was just let my hair start to grow and um, and I, yeah, I just went through, yeah, just a real loosening and loosening. And then I remember later on, at a certain point, I think maybe six months later, I was at a gathering and I was talking with someone around something and and I had I was growing the hair under my arms as part of my loosening up and letting go and just watching the thoughts. And then I noticed six months later I was talking about it and I could feel I had pre I actually had pride about having hair. <laughs> hairy armpits as if that was more spiritual than shaving them and so at that point Jesus told me okay time to shave <laughs> so it's a constant undoing it's a constant loosening um, and watching how you know the mind just gets hold of something and says ah oh, good I've achieved this now now I know something you know and off it goes and Jesus is like no 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 we want to keep yeah, going through this constant undoing, you know, because the end result is I do not know the, the thing I am, where I'm going, how to look upon myself or the world. That is a state of mind that is, is completely free of a self-concept, is completely open to, to being shown who I am, being told who I am by the presence of love, you know, undefended, unprotected unmanaged, my God, unmanaged. So. And I think the other part of the transfer of training that is so essential is is really in um, as I mentioned earlier around bringing projection back in you know, like whatever you see in your brother that uh, you would not want you know, is just an immediate opportunity for practicing with forgiveness and practicing with allowing that perception of whatever is being seen in your brother as being something for you to forgive and take inward and and also with this there's just absolutely no exceptions you know there are no exceptions to this practice it's the only way to have a total release of the mind from the ego because yeah, no matter how much something you could say, well, that's definitely the ego and that's not me. But if there's any sense of a charge you know, or personal reaction in any way, then it is for you. It is for you to, to use you know, in that moment. And, um, and it's important that we don't skip over, that we don't skip over any of these opportunities to to practice and see because it, it is our pathway to freedom, really to true freedom. So I just feel to open it up now. Um. We've been talking a lot about purpose and how once you have decided that you want to know the truth of who you are, 
um, and you give everything over, that everything can be used for your awakening when the purpose changes. But there's been a lot of questions I find, um, and it's a common denominator here, where people are not, uh, they're on this journey, but they're not married to a mystic. And in fact, they're not in a relationship with someone who's on the same path as them. And um, a lot of these, a lot of the guys just want to join for hours and talk about the course and and yet they're, they're torn because their wives don't even want to hear anything about it or even join them. And they're, they're torn. What do they do on the weekend when they're off? Spend it with their wife or spend it with the people they, they feel to spend it with. And it's, it seems that a lot of the women are pregnant right now and there's a lot of tears every time we join, every time we speak, because they want so much what we're doing, but that their husbands don't even want to hear about it basically. And they live a very different life. And so there seems to be like a, just a confusion on how to, how to do this path when the people you live with aren't interested. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, it's why the course really is called a self-study course because um, it is all a transformation of one's own mind and it's also, I love this about Jesus, <laughs> he says, it's a self-study course and your way will be different. Holy relationship is your means. So he's saying it's all about the healing for your own mind. You're not here to heal anyone else's mind or, or take some kind of form-based approach with anything. It's a self-study course between you and God. This is the relationship that's really being healed. And the means for that healing will be given you, and that will be relationship. And so it's very interactive. You know, our way is very interactive of using the relationships um, that we have for the healing of our own mind. So I just feel that this exact topic of transfer of training is... There are no exceptions. You know, I've, I've met friends who have said, yeah, it's okay for you, but I have a child. You know, it's different for me. I'm not freed up like you are. Or another friend has said, well, it's, you know, it's easier for you, you know, but I have a husband or I have a wife or I have a mortgage or I have a debt or I have, you know, there, there's always a reason. There's always an exception, an exceptional reason that could be holding you back. And, and so whatever that is that could possibly be the exception is what needs to be brought to the light and that's where the mind needs to practice with and I would say the practice is the same for all of us it's looking at our own motivation and it's looking at um, the purpose of what we're doing why we're doing it and compromise is compromise it doesn't matter whether you're compromising within a holy relationship where the two of you um, have a purpose of healing the mind or you're compromising with your child or you're compromising with your husband or your wife compromise is compromise and salvation is no compromise of any kind so it really is up to each one to, to do their work and and look at the motivation and look at the fear of loss and the reasons for um, why there would be compromising or doing something out of um, those re people pleasing reasons you know I need to I have to he won't understand she won't understand you know really they're just when those thoughts come up there's fear underneath them there's a fear of really being true you know, to ourself and true to our calling. So that's the first step, I think, is just nurturing this um, relationship with the Holy Spirit and nurturing the development of this relationship. And the more that's nurtured, the more you can then speak from that and speak on behalf of that and, and let the chips fall, really. Most of compromise comes out of a fear of reaction, a fear of hurting someone else or being rejected. 
and those are the that is the belief in one's own mind the belief in rejection the belief in attack the belief that I could hurt those that I love those are the deeply held um, beliefs in everyone's mind or in the mind and and they're what are to be healed so um, prayer really shows the way and and practicing with the lessons shows the way and yeah I feel in that sense that it's it's like a blanket approach it's everything is for forgiveness and there's no hierarchy of illusions or difficulty when it comes to miracles like Jesus can arrange for the miracle worker so then the question becomes am I a miracle worker in this moment who am I identified with am I playing a role am I protecting and defending a role or am I a miracle worker and a miracle worker can have the the prayer of show me there's no sacrifice I want to serve you I want to put you first and this is what the day is starting to look like help me follow your guidance you know. And, and it's just miraculous then to put your hands and put your life in the Holy Spirit's hands and and be shown because we have to be convinced through miracles you know we have to be convinced and shown that when we really go for God then we are doing it for all we are doing it for those that we love but we we you know that I who does not know divine love yet and is afraid of loss and is afraid of hurting those that are loved can't possibly know the way to undo that like that is the self that has to be undone through giving it over you know, and asking for help mm. yeah it's moment by moment I feel that's that's what's really important it's a moment by moment practice and a moment by moment devotion um, and then it takes it out of you know when we think of it in terms of time then it can it can seem frightening and that there's this big something you know that's going to happen or this big drop off into an abyss that's going to happen or this big fear of loss that's going to happen but the most important thing I think is continuing to nurture this relationship with the Holy Spirit now and not put it off no. Well, I can't yet because, you know, I can't be fully committed yet because the because that's that's what we need to bring to the light and question and see is that really true? Can this really hold me back? Do I want this to be holding me back from my relationship with God? And this kind of inquiry, you know, actually opens us up to to then seeing the purpose. What am I using this relationship for? Is it actually being used to support the relationship with God? Or am I using it as a defense against my relationship with God? And when you can really see that, you know, then you can see even more clearly, whoa, I'm holding myself and my brother to the past. I'm holding us into an identity that's, that's not how God would see my brother or how God would see me. And with that questioning, it's, it's, it can allow a loosening to happen. And then it comes to the prayer of, okay, and I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to have this healed. But the willingness to look and the willingness to question and the willingness to see the purpose moment by moment, you know, day by day, is how the loosening occurs. Yeah, I very much used to have that question myself. Um, well, it's okay for me, but what about everyone else? And I watched the movie Brother, Son, Sister Moon, where Francesco goes to see the Pope, and uh, they, they come up to seeing him, and <sighs> Francesco says that very same thing to the Pope, or he's saying to the Pope, you know, I just want to be free. And the Pope says, well, you know, what about those that come after you? And 
and Francesco said, but if God is taking care of us, how could he not ca take care of everyone else? You know, how could he not? Like, it was such a flip. How, how could he not take care of everyone? Like, was that question to him was unfathomable. Like, but if he takes care of me, you know, and, and who am I for him to care about as if I'm special and different to everyone else? Of course he's going to take care of everyone. And yet, is it, we have to give ourselves to God to be taken care of, you know. That's where the, you know, everyone has this calling to be taken care of by God and to be, um, to be, to be called. And, and yet some are just not ready yet to go just completely put themselves in the Holy Spirit's hands. And I feel that's the, really the whole journey is to, in the end, we have ourselves completely and utterly in God's hands, you know, that's, that's where this is leading to. So. So are there any other questions on this topic? Yes, hi. Um, my question in regards to transfer of training has to do with, um, with addictions. I have a problem with binge eating. And I'm wondering if you have had any experience in that direction and because um, I find transfer of training in other areas is working, you could say, mm -hmm. more or less for me. But when it comes to this specific area, I feel so cut off. Mm -hmm. And um, I, yeah, I would appreciate any insight you could share. And if you have had a, any kind of similar experience, that would also be very helpful. Sure. Sure. Um, one of the one of the things I had no idea that I had an addiction to was sleep. <laughs> so that was a surprise. But uh, I noticed at a certain point um, I was traveling and there was a day after day after day up to about eight days. Something happened where my sleep was disturbed. And there were all these different reasons. You know, first it was that I drank too much caffeine that day. And then the next day we were staying at a friend's house and the dogs were barking all night. And so I was woken up. And the third night there was snoring. And then the fourth night, I think David was up and rustling around. And then the next night it was the dogs again. And then a siren went off. And, you know, it was... And after that I... I uh, was my mind was just going into all of this turmoil and I went deeply into prayer to look at you know all of these beliefs that I had about sleep and this is where you know you could transfer this this training of this process over to whatever the addiction seems to be um, because in the end it's it's all the same there's something that we're going for that we um, feel that we need some comfort from. And uh, when it's associated really strongly with something, whether it's food or um, sex or drugs or cigarettes or sleep, you know, they're just the form that the mind is latching onto of like, this gives me comfort and this helps um, alleviate my mind for a moment from something else. So I went through looking at the beliefs I had about sleep and I was amazed to see what I, all the causation and safety, you know, that I had in it. And I believed that sleep, um, I needed certain hours of sleep, certain amount of sleep to feel rested. Um, I believe that if I didn't get the right amount of sleep that I would get headaches uh, if I didn't get the right amount of sleep and uninterrupted sleep then um, I would be affected by that the next day and that I wouldn't be able to have my full energy to be of service to God and I also saw that it was a time of escape that was the core thing, that sleep was actually time out from the ego, 
and the intensity of dealing with my own mind. And I think that was the the stronghold that it had, was that it, it was time out. So when I traced these all down, um, I came down to the core question of who needs sleep? You know, who is it that is disturbed, distressed, can feel tired, can feel grumpy, can feel attacked, can feel like a victim of all of these circumstances? Is that the Holy Spirit? Is that my spiritual identity? Or is that Kirsten a personality as a body? And then when I got down to that question, I could clearly see you know, who it was that was so invested in sleep. And then the question comes, you know, do I want this? Do I, do I want to keep maintaining this for myself, this experience? And that was the point where I could willingly, of course, say no, I don't want this. But it was quite a, an ongoing practice. I could go through that inner inquiry once and see it and say, of course I want to give this to you, I want to be free of pain. But the very next night, there I was again, you know, dealing with the desire for sleep, the struggle that I'm not getting what I need, you know, and all the reasons why it was being, something was being held away from me. And I had to keep going through that practice, the inner inquiry practice, over and over again, until finally um, I had a real experience of um, at a certain point, I just realized that I hadn't noticed whether I'd been sleeping well or not, and I was full of energy. But that, I feel, was very much associated with having a purpose, a, a, a redirection for my mind to, to pour my mind energy into. So there was opportunities where I wanted to be available for the spirit and even if I felt tired and physically tired there was something else that was calling me more so than going well I don't know I'm, I'm a bit tired I don't know if I really have the energy maybe maybe I should you know just go and take a nap there was something else that was impelling me to say I want to transcend this belief I want to be shown that the spirit will give me the energy that I need you know and I feel like that's a huge part of the, of the healing, is redirecting our mind to the spirit and to being shown that everything we need, including the comfort, including the time out, including the peace and the joy, you know, is going to come from the spirit. That is extremely helpful <laughs> it's extremely powerful mm -hmm. I, I i've been having a lot of sleep issues as well so it, it, it kind of connects very nicely the one question that does come up for me is okay i can't ask or maybe i can what do i need food for i mean when you think about that question what is it for in our worldly concept in this illusion we need food to stay alive but if it's only an illusion, theoretically, I could say, well, we don't really need food to stay alive. Yeah, and it comes back to moment by moment asking what is it for. So rather than asking about food in general, it's more moment by moment, where is my mind? In this moment, the eating, if it's, say, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, at this moment I'm about to eat this, what is it for? Do I feel like I'm with the Holy Spirit? Or is there some kind of attack in my mind where I'm pushing myself, or I've been pushing myself, and now I, I want a, some comfort, and so I'm going to eat. And so it's moment by moment asking what is it for, and then just taking that time to pray and give it over to the Holy Spirit and saying, okay, I just, I want to be with you. And if it feels peaceful, then... I'll go ahead and eat. <laughs> so it's not the eating or the not eating. It's it really is the purpose and the moment of what is it for. Mm, yes, mm. that is extremely helpful. Mm. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Extremely grateful. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Yeah, the, just the transfer value of this. You, know, you can feel it. It's like a, a lighthouse sweep going through our whole mind. You know, it's, we just want the light to be invited everywhere and leave no stone unturned. You know, leave no areas where there's some pocket of, you know, something that's unloving. You know, as our motivation in in any areas. So. Yeah, I'm very grateful to join in this purpose with you all and support this awareness you know, that we're worthy of this total commitment, actually, because it brings us home to God. It brings us home to the awareness of our true nature as spirit that is not dependent on the world and not dependent on the things you know, that the ego is just so insistent that we need for our survival and for our happiness and for our joy and for our freedom it's like no we're just bringing all of those to the light through prayer and being shown you know, moment by moment what his will is for us well thank you everyone it's one 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 according to my clock so thank you. See you next week.